Welcome, this is Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. And we'll be the architects of your journey through the afterlife. Today we're discussing Season 1, Episode 2, Flying. This episode was written by Alan Yang and directed by Michael McDonald, and it aired Monday, September 19th, 2016. So before we dive into the episode today, we received some correspondence from listeners, and I just wanted to touch on some of their questions and some of their thoughts. So we received a really insightful email from Alan. Thank you so much, Alan. And Alan mentioned that he believes The Good Place has a secular humanist ethos. Ethos meaning character, the guiding beliefs that characterize a community. So instead of utilitarianism, he believes it's secular humanism. Hmm. Which is, to put simply, the belief that humans are capable of morality and self-fulfillment without a belief in God. Secular humanists don't believe that humans are inherently good or evil. And it believes in the constant search for objective truth through science and philosophy that changes with new discoveries. So nothing is fixed. Nothing is written in stone, necessarily. People adjust based on the information that they're given. And some of the good deeds that could get you into heaven might change over time as well, depending on the world that you were living in. Sure, that's kind of like driving with the flow of traffic. You have to adjust based on what's surrounding you. Yeah, and... Well, for example, one of the good deeds that was uh, displayed in the first episode was eating vegan. Right. Which may not have been such a good deed or maybe maybe would not have been worth as many points a long, long time ago before factory farming. If someone had eaten meat like years and years and years and years ago and it was just, you know, they went fishing and they'd get a fish. Right, like, that's how you ate. That's how you got your dinner. Yeah, you went that out, kind you of hunted thing. boar, whatever. So those points get. So maybe those points would be higher now, since the impact on the environment could be a lot worse now. Yeah. Do you believe that the good place is modeled after secular humanism instead of utilitarianism, which is what we were saying last time on the show? I believe that it is still quite utilitarian. Okay. Yeah, I think. It's sort of a mishmash, maybe, of the two models. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And we also had uh, a few questions from a listener and a dear friend of mine, Allie. She asked what we think about the language translation. So in the first episode, Chidi mentions that he's not actually speaking English. He's speaking French. But The Good Place translates whatever language you're speaking into something that the other person can understand. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I think they did it for a very particular reason. I think they did it because at some point, if they did, if they hadn't have mentioned that, if they hadn't brought it up, people would have said, you've basically whitewashed the whole show. Everyone's speaking English. What's going on? Why is this guy from, I'm going to pull an Eleanor here, but Senegal um, is speaking English. This doesn't make sense. So they needed to mention why everybody was speaking English. Yes. Do you think it would have had a different impact on the show if instead of saying, oh, it translates whatever language you're speaking into something you can understand versus having everybody every understand everyone else's language? Like suddenly you're imbued with like this insane knowledge of every language on the planet right. and the show would act like everyone's still speaking English, but really everyone's just able to understand each other. I think I would prefer that. Yeah. Because mm, okay. it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't exclude anybody, almost. Everyone becoming like citizens of the world? Right. They're all, they all what? becoming okay. one. They're all getting the knowledge of every language. Okay. So in my head, they would all be hearing the other languages mm-hmm. and they would understand it rather than the languages being translated. Right. Into right. whatever they're most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting to think of like, what is cheaty hearing when Eleanor tries to swear. Right. Because she says words like fork instead of the F word, right? Right. But the F word's not the same thing in French. Right. What is his translation of our podcast, Fork and Bullshit? <laughs> yeah, good point. What's What's the title of our podcast in French? Yeah. All right, so let's dive into the episode. So in this episode, Eleanor asks and receives yellow and blue striped pajamas from Janet. 
She attends a neighborhood meeting where things return to normal on their own. Afterwards, Chidi explains his dilemma to Eleanor, explaining that she is extremely self-obsessed. In a flashback, we see Eleanor angering her co-workers by trying to avoid being the designated driver during a night out. Alright, so this is the first time we see Chidi's chalkboard. And Woohoo! <laughs> well, that's exciting to me, Jason. It is very exciting. And I wanted to point out a few of the things that he wrote down and sort of a little bit of uh, research that I did. So there's plenty of people that he referenced here Mm -hmm. that we're not going to talk about in this episode because they they will be more relevant in following episodes. So the ones I wanted to talk about today were uh, Chidi wrote Utilitarian Under Fears. And we talked a lot about utilitarianism last episode. And we're talking about how utilitarianism is all about maximizing happiness, maximizing pleasure, right? So utilitarianism is kind of thought to be hedonistic sometimes, like pleasure equals good, and that's what matters. Mm -hmm. But it's not egoistic. So it says that we should act to produce the greatest good for the greatest number, but that doesn't mean always doing what you want to do. It's interesting to think, like, by refusing to sacrifice herself, is Eleanor denying the greatest good for the greatest number? Right. So I think that's part of Chidi's dilemma Mm -hmm. is, does he help her so that she can fit in with everybody and everybody can be happy? Okay. Because he's pretty sure that she's causing these problems. Or does he turn her in and the good place is better because of it and these crummy things stop happening? Mm Mm-hmm. So what does he do? He is in a dilemma yeah he is vexed at the moment (laughs) yeah he says i've broken it down into two options turn you in or don't (laughs) (laughs) which are really the only two options yep yeah um and he references well he's actually reading a book and he talks to eleanor about it very briefly he references groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals by Immanuel Kant. Uh, Kant was a moral absolutist, so he believed that particular actions were intrinsically right or intrinsically wrong, regardless of the context of the act. So stealing would be wrong, even if it's done to feed a starving family. Right. Lying would be wrong, even if it's done to save, like, someone's life. Mm -hmm. So based on that evidence... I have to think that Kant would say that Chidi and Eleanor's actions are morally wrong because they are lying, even by omission, right, yeah. at the moment. Well, Kant's view of things are is extremely binary, and it's really... It doesn't really work, in my opinion, and it doesn't work in this situation. Mm-hmm. You can't have a situation such as this where there's just a black and white. There is no black and white in this. Yeah. For Kant, it would be. Because he believes that Is he alive right now? No. Well, then. (laughs) Are you just saying, like, suck it, Kant? I don't care. Basically, (laughs) like, he probably died because, you know, he thought things were black and white. And then he got hit by a gray truck. Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay, fine. Maybe not, but... Um, Okay. Well, he thought that following these kinds of ideas, like knowing what's right and what's wrong in the world would help you make the right decision and Mm -hmm. help you be virtuous. Um, And he said that deceiving someone, so lying, would rob them of their ability to make an autonomous decision because that decision is now based on false information. So Michael believes that Eleanor is meant to be here, Mm -hmm. that she is a good person. Lying by omission is deceiving him still. Because he can't make a decision, right? Or he's making his decision to what is Eleanor not do anything. Omitting? What is she omitting? That she's not supposed to be there. Like but she told him straight out. She didn't tell Michael. She told Chidi. Right. right? So she's not lying to Chidi. She's lying to Michael. Mm-hmm. And to the rest of the community. Yeah. By pretending that she belongs. Right. Lying by omission. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So... 
this takes away the right of everybody, really, to Mm -hmm. make a decision because they're all operating under false information. Mm -hmm. They all believe that she's supposed to be there, so no one is doing anything. Right. Right? Chidi's the only one who knows. So she was honest with him. Like, Eleanor was honest right off the bat with Chidi, so she's not deceiving him in any way. No. Yeah. Well, they're soulmates. They have to be honest with each other. Yeah, and she's (laughs) allowing him to decide what he wants to do based on that. Like, she knows that she can't really choose his decision. Like, she can't make a choice for him. He has to make it for himself. Yeah. Which we see in this episode. She's not, like, threatening to do anything to him whenever she asks. No. She's not saying, if you don't keep my secret, I'm going to lock you in a cage or... Hey, you can ask Janet for anything. She could ask for a cage, I guess. Right? (laughs) Um, She's kind of guilting him a little bit. She is. But only barely. And he doesn't know her that well. So I don't think that he would be completely swayed by guilt. No, no. He would totally get where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. Be like, no, you can't. You can't fool me into this. And she's not saying, oh, well, if you tell Michael, well, I'm going to tell him that you don't belong here. Or... I'm going to mm-hmm. tell him that I told you this secret and you kept it from him too or you were going to help me hide or whatever. Right. She's not trying to throw him under the bus at any point. She's allowing him to make his own conscious choice. Which leads into my next question uh, and comments about your favorite guy, Kant. Uh, he also believed that we are all an ends in ourselves. So that means that we are not objects that exist to be used by others. We are all autonomous persons with our own desires, our own goals, our own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And he believed that that autonomy imbued us or imbues us with an absolute moral worth. So we are worthy people and we shouldn't be manipulated or manipulate others for our own benefit. Right. Do you think she sees Chidi as a means to an end or does she see him as an end in himself? Basically, I'm trying to say, do you think she's using him Mm -hmm. for her own benefit? Or do you think she still sees him as his own person with his, like, own desires and goals and beliefs, interests, that kind of thing, and is just asking for help? At this point, I think she's using him as a means to an end because she doesn't really know him. She finds somebody or somebody is thrust upon her that is her soulmate and can actually teach her how to belong so i think she sees that as a great opportunity Mm -hmm. so i think at this point in the show she definitely see now i'm beginning to doubt that opinion because there's (laughs) there's little tidbits that we saw in the first episode where she is honest with him she opens up briefly when after the party yeah and that leads me to believe that Maybe like 90%, 10% means to an end. And like the other is like, maybe there is actually a person there instead of an object I can use. Okay. See, I disagree with you. I think that we start this episode seeing Eleanor using him as a means to an end. Yeah. She is clearly just happy to have him there. So that he can teach her how to be a good person. And that's all she cares about. Right. And he points that out. Like, you're selfish. You don't know anything about me, regardless of the fact that we spent the entire, like, all of yesterday together. Yeah. And then by the end of the episode, even though it's such a small little gift she gives him. (laughs) And I'm saying gift with, like, air quotes here. um, Of saying, like, I remember where you're from. Look, Senegal. Yeah. And not only that, but at at that point, like, well, slightly before that, she really didn't think that he was going to help her anymore. Mm -hmm. But I don't have the feeling that she was going to stop talking to him, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we're starting to see her move towards seeing him as his own autonomous person. But we still have a long way to go. Yes. Yeah. She's got some growth to do. She's still Eleanor. She's still Eleanor, right. She hasn't become a saint overnight or anything. So do you want to talk about those flashbacks? 
Um, actually, I think we should talk about the flashbacks at the end of the episode once we've got all three of them. Okay. And then we can talk about them individually. Um, on a more lighthearted note, the sweating joke is gross, right? Ugh. Michael, like super gross? Come on. What's that all about? Okay, the whole, oh, do you lick it? Oh, no, no. you dab it with a clock, and cloth then and then it. you lick it? No, What's that? That's unnecessary. I don't know. I, don't know. It's, mm. I guess it's meant to show that Michael is not a human. He's literally not a human. He has been put into this body that he created for himself. And he has no idea how humans act or their what their biological, you know, things are. What's inside them and what happens to them. I didn't like it. Yeah, it was just kind of gross. It in seemed my unnecessarily opinion. gross. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of nasty. He does it so innocently, too. Like, ugh. No thanks. No. What did you make of Janet asking Eleanor what kind of pornography she would like to see? So she asks, Eleanor asks Janet, you know, is this an incognito browsing situation or can anyone see what I ask you about? Yeah. And she immediately responds with, what kind of pornography would you like to see? That leads me to believe that this isn't the first time that Janet's been asked this question. Yeah, no, definitely. She is used to that. <laughs> so that's like probably one of the first things people ask, which is a red flag. It's weird, right? Yeah. yeah? Okay. It's a little weird. But it's heaven, right? Or it's it's the good place. So nothing's off limits except swearing. But not porn. But not porn. Which is interesting. I wonder if you could ask Janet to turn off the swear filter. Oh, huh. I don't know if she can operate over, like, the general functions of the good place. Because she can't seem to be able to stop the trash storm. That's true. So I doubt she could make, like, huge changes in programming. Right. Yeah. She just has all the information and can create things, but she can't adjust how the structure of the good place actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Michael seems to be the only one who can really do that. Right. Okay. As the architect, right? All right, so moving on. With everything under control, Michael returns to the good places orientation with a lesson in flying. Tahani interrupts, suggesting that they all help clean up the mess left behind. Oh, bless you, Tahani. Eleanor scoffs and Chidi immediately volunteers them both for the task. Michael is worried that he has made a complete disaster and Tahani pledges to help lift his spirits. Eleanor asks Chidi again if he'll help her, but Chidi is unable to decide. It's either a yes or a no. In another flashback, we see Eleanor conveniently forget her turn as designated driver. (laughs) Conveniently. Yeah, conveniently forget. Love it. Yeah. I'm glad they brought up flying because someone was going to. Yeah. It's the good place. Why can't you fly? And you can. You can totally fly. So supervised flying yeah super well at first you can't just like superman all over the place i'm sure you could eventually after you Mm -hmm. learn okay i don't really think about that i figured it would always be like a supervised activity i think as soon as everybody learned how to fly you could just have at it oh yeah that's that's what my good place would be like you'd pretty much be flying all the time I guess without the fear of death, I would probably be more comfortable with flying. And no airplanes coming by. That's true. Although that wasn't really a big concern of mine. It was mostly the, oh god, oh god, I'm gonna die kind of feeling. What would from, kill you? Um, falling a out slip of the stream? sky? I don't know. Suddenly not being able to fly. Mm, which, right. okay. I mean, would still probably scare me in this place. But I would also know that landing smack on the floor... Or on the ground wouldn't actually kill me. I'm already right. dead. I'm totally with Eleanor here. I would be devastated if I couldn't learn how to fly. Yeah, I would be pretty bummed about it. But I would also assume that it would come again. You know, that it wouldn't be like the only time that I would ever be able to fly. Right. It would just be very hard to put other people kind of before yourself like i don't think anyone is particularly bothered because no one was saying well let's do this before we do flying you know Mm -hmm. let's everyone do this together like there are clearly people who are fine with not 
volunteering. Absolutely. And flying. So I guess I would have assumed, oh, well, maybe I can go to tomorrow's lesson. Something like that. Why doesn't Janet just clean up everything? Or Michael? Yeah, you would really think that in the good place, you wouldn't have to do all this kind of cleaning, right? Mm -hmm. But then again, in the good place, there shouldn't be trash storms. That's true, so, too. So I, Eleanor yeah. is causing some problems. She really is. She's really mixing things up. She's causing people to have to clean, which is just evil. <laughs> Unless you're those two guys. Oh, yeah. Gunnar and Antonio, who yep. are super enjoying cleaning up. They love it. It's implied that they're soulmates, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I also noticed that we had a same-sex couple, uh, women, in the front row sitting right next to Tahani and Jianyu. How'd you know they were a couple? They were holding hands. They were all, like, lovey-dovey together. Okay. Um, I also noticed that there's not really any old people here, which uh, my friend Allie pointed out as well. She was like, where are the old folks, people? Like, hello? I think <laughs> everybody is put onto into an age where their happiest oh not the age that they died right okay it would be nice to see a little bit more diversity like i did notice some people that seemed a bit older maybe in their 50s but there mm -hmm. definitely wasn't an abundance of like gray hair 70 and, year olds or yeah, anything like that sure. so it's sort of like hey this is the good place where everyone died in their prime of life <laughs> <laughs> oh awkward is that good or not good yeah. <laughs> um I don't know if you noticed, but Tahani changes her outfit before she starts picking up the garbage. Of course she does. Of course she does. And she puts on these gardening the gloves, gloves. that are like <laughs> orange or something. No, they're, well, they're purple. Oh, they're purple. Um, yeah. But they're, she's doing like the least amount of work that can still be considered work. It looks like she's just sort of like poking pieces of garbage <laughs> slowly and um, either she finished her section, like finished clearing her section of garbage, or she just completely abandoned it as soon as Michael was in need of help. Mm -hmm. I do like her little name drop of Princess Diana. Oh, it doesn't matter what she's a princess of. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was funny. I did enjoy that one. Yeah. I mean, she's still as kind of condescending and humble braggy as ever, but I did like her better in this episode. So that's something. Yeah, because once you, I think once you understand who the character is and what she's going to be like, you can kind of appreciate it. Mm -hmm. She does do a few more name drops throughout the season, which is great. Oh yeah, some really big ones. Yeah. So when Eleanor asks Chidi if he's going to help her, he mentions Aristotle. And I just kind of wanted to go over Aristotle's thinking here. So he believed that virtue is a skill. That can only be learned through experience. So it's a habit. So if you do a good thing again and again, it is going to eventually become a part of your character. Mm -hmm. So he believed that we could learn from moral exemplars, someone like Chidi, sure. or other people in the good place, and emulate their behavior. And then over time, it would just become ingrained behavior in us, right? We mm -hmm. would become good people by watching good people. You'd no longer have to try to be good. You would just learn to be good it would just be good by nature yes exactly well, it not would by just... nature but by learning mm -hmm. so eleanor's proposal of you know teach me how to be a good person really seems to be based on this theory that goodness you know virtuousness can be learned right through experience and we'll see her trying to emulate chidi and other good people in the good place and it may feel kind of forced at first like when she feels forced to actually go and pick up the garbage because Chidi's, you know, volunteering vol for her. telling her to do it. Right. And, but eventually she hopes that she'll actually become a good person too. Like, I don't think that she's hoping, oh man, I hope I'm going to become a really great liar and be able to do all this stuff without actually caring. I think hmm. there is an actual desire to become a good person. See, I didn't get that. No? It seemed to me that... She just wanted the quick fix. Okay. Because she seems to want to become a good person with the least amount of effort. Hmm. She says when he shows her all these books, she says, like, isn't there a 
a pill I could take. Yeah, a, isn't there a pill I could take or something like that? So she, she doesn't seem to actually want to put the work in. She just wants it to be done. Okay. And But at the same time, you're right, she actually does make an effort to continually ask him. And she does try to get him to help her. So at least that's showing some desire. But does she really want to work for it? That's what I'm not really sure of at this point. Yeah, and I think that's what we're trying to figure out in this episode. Mm -hmm. Is Eleanor going to put the effort in? Or is she going to try and, you know, coast on this deception? Yeah. She blows off cleaning. She shoves everything under, you know, under a rug, in bike baskets, in the dumpster. Like, she just... Because she wants to fly. So she Mm -hmm. just crams everything everywhere and doesn't put the work in. Yeah. And I also wanted to bring up another philosopher that Chidi had written on his chalkboard... Which I'm assuming this was sort of where he was going with um, with writing down that name. So he wrote uh, Hume, Treaties. So he's talking about David Hume. And it's a, a treatise of human nature that he's referencing here. He believed that people had to be trained to be benevolent, to be decent, and to be sympathetic. So that helps Eleanor's case because she can be taught to be a good person by witnessing good examples by being taught good examples as well and through encouragement. Mm -hmm. So Chidi's saying like, oh, you're doing a good job here. Like this is a good effort to to make. Michael explains to Tahani that even the slightest flaw will cause the good place to fall apart. He notices a dog and believing it to be a flaw, he kicks it into the sun. Realizing his mistake, Michael retrieves the dog, giving her back to her owner. He explains that it is merely a construct, incapable of feeling love or pain. Janet declares that there are only five minutes left in the day of his flying lesson, and Eleanor hides her remaining trash and puts on a flying suit. Just as Eleanor begins to float, trash begins to rain from the sky. Chidi decides that Eleanor's actions prove she is not worth helping. Wow. So, we gotta talk about the dog. Really? Yes, we gotta talk about the dog. Okay, let's talk about the dog. Um, sup with this, right? Like, okay. <laughs> okay, listeners, Vivian's a dog person. She loves dogs. I love dogs. I love animals in general. I don't like this idea that animals can't go to the good place or that the good place can't have actual animals. Like he's saying his decision to kick teacup into the sun is based on the belief that teacup is a flaw. She is an error in the system. Right. Which would imply that animals are not a regular part of the good place. Right. Or at least of this good place, right? Correct. So, why? So, does, if somebody wants a pet, they can ask Janet for a pet. Yeah, that's but where... he doesn't seem to be aware of that. Well, that's where teacup must have come from. I suppose, yeah. Honestly, unless, I didn't think about it. Unless but... this person... No, I, I got nothing. Because yeah. there's no other way for an animal to be there. Why would... Michael think that teacup is a flaw if it is something that Janet can freely give to people. Honestly, I think it's because at this point, Michael's kind of freaking out and he's not thinking rationally. He's panicking about the trash. He's panicking about all the the issues that are happening and that have happened. So he's just looking for flaws and he happens to see a dog with no owner. I mean, if that lady was standing right beside the dog, he wouldn't have thought it was a flaw. Okay, so you think because he believes it's like a stray dog. Right. That that's why it's a flaw. Because there shouldn't be stray dogs wandering around. And also because he is panicking. Right. I don't like this because he says that it's a construct of a dog and it can't feel love or pain or Mm -hmm. joy or sadness, right? So even if... You ask for a dog or a cat or a turtle or something from Janet, then Mm -hmm. it's not that real animal. It's just a made up thing. Right. Right. And that's kind of messed up. I really like the idea of, you know, a good place having animals that hopefully can live forever and have a good life just like we would. So where would they come from? The animals that they were on Earth. Like, the same kind of idea as, like, human beings, right? Like, animal dies and goes to 
the good place. So do you think that the animals would have to go through the point system? Maybe, yeah. But I guess I just really... I don't like the idea that the animals that are here are not real. Mm -hmm. That they're just constructed in the same way that the buildings are constructed and the trees are constructed. Mm -hmm. So you'd like to believe that there will be a good place where people and animals can live in harmony. Yes, definitely. Yep. That is how I feel about that. I totally agree, but I still like that moment. Because it's so cartoony and over the top? Yes, and also because Michael is just freaking out at this point. He's like, oh my god, what do I do with this dog? I better, instead of like snapping my fingers and making it disappear, I'm going to kick it into the sun. It's a slight overreaction. A little bit. (laughs) Just a little bit. No, yeah, you're right. Like, Ted Danson does a really good job in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it is so unexpected, I think, is it completely takes you off guard and you're like, oh my gosh, he he just just kicked kicked a a dog into the sun and it went poof. Yep. Like, a little explosion. What? Which, of course, we would never be able to see, but I love that they added that in anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting... But uh, he gets the dog back. Yes, he does get the dog back. Totally unharmed and unscathed. And then he immediately says to uh, the woman, Evita, mm-hmm. he says, well, do you want a dog that actually would love you more? Because I can kick this one right back into the sun and get you another one. <laughs> yeah. Which makes you think, okay, well, does Michael just think that any animal is interchangeable? Yes. I totally believe that. Yeah, He okay. doesn't understand that relationship that people have with animals okay so that's it's interesting anyway he doesn't get yeah. that yeah. yeah i noticed that tahani doesn't do anything to stop michael as soon as he starts heading over to the dog like and she acts like she didn't witness anything at all <laughs> when evita shows up and she's walking out of the frozen yogurt shop and she's saying well, where's my dog? Has anyone seen my dog? And Tahani just goes right back to eating her frozen yogurt. So mm-hmm. way to be a bystander, Tahani. Yeah. Well, and... she's not going to throw <laughs> her creator, her architect, under the bus. I think I probably would have said something. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> yeah, well, sign me up for some stitches then. <laughs> Somebody um, better call a doctor. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I like that. I wish I'd said that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We can edit it together with oh, magic. that's... True. Editing magic. And uh, Jianyu doesn't seem bothered at all. Well, he doesn't say anything either. He doesn't say anything, and he doesn't even <laughs> seem to have he much of a reaction. Say anything. Well, the, yeah, of course he doesn't say anything. But he doesn't really react No, either. he doesn't. No, he just sees it happen, kind of goes, huh, and then goes right back to his yo- frozen yogurt, which I assume is quite good if you just don't care about something like that. Tahani says there's like a million flavors, and she can taste them all. So well, it's probably amazing froyo. Okay, yeah, but sardines wouldn't go well with like birthday cake. In the good place it does. <sighs> <laughs> I could do this all day. Yep, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> if, but if we're going to ha- start answering because it's the good place for everything, then mm-hmm. uh, we're going to run into some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so later that evening, Tahani continues trying to console Michael who appears to be on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Tahani begs Jianyu to say something, but instead he sits beside Michael and touches his heart, which manages to embolden Michael once more. So I just want to stop here before we continue to the end of the episode and ask, what did you think of Jianyu's action here? I would say it's beautiful. Oh, that's sweet. Why it would is. you say it's, it's beautiful? It's so innocent and pure. He just looks at Michael and he doesn't need to say a thing. He just gives him a little touch in his chest and that's all he needs. Mm -hmm. It's very, very thoughtful. It's very friendly. It's relaxed. It's, it's comforting. Yeah. I guess sort of like it's comforting to just have someone give you a hug or to sit beside you when you're feeling upset, right? And not blame you or make you feel worried or you don't even need or try and comfort you by giving you advice or something like that sometimes just some physical contact and michael might not really understand how important that can be because he isn't human so something like that could mean a lot more to him yeah 
uh, as like a first experience for yeah. sure. Um, I agree with you. I love this moment. Um, I think we're meant to see it as very comedic, like as though Michael is seeing more than there actually is there. Right. Right? Because he's like, oh no, I understand. And this is the strength was inside of me all the time. And whatever it's exactly meant to sound he says. cheesy but... or silly. But I think it's great. I actually get like a little emotional during that <laughs> moment. I'm like, this is so beautiful. Like mm-hmm. he's, he's so peaceful. Like there's no trace of anxiety in him. And G- Tahani is kind of just full of anxiety at this point. Like she's trying so hard to make him feel better about himself. Mm-hmm. That she's starting to freak out too, right? right? And here's John Yu, perfectly calm, serene, comes over and he's been listening the whole time. He's been there. He's witnessed every moment. He knows what's going on. Of Michael's like freak out yeah. over the day. But he doesn't have to say anything. He just touches his heart, kind of reminding him like, hey, you're still here. You're still breathing. You know, well, as a new human, I guess, or whatever. We trust you. We have faith in you. Yeah. And... You haven't let us down. It's just such a... It's really a beautiful moment. I really... Yeah, I agree with you there. Definitely. I like that Tahani has been trying to make Jianyu speak multiple times this episode. Yes. It's like, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Let's both say it at the same time. And then... Grace us with our your vocalized wisdom. Yeah. And, <laughs> and this ends up happening... No speaking, no anything, and he manages to do so much by not saying anything at all. Mm-hmm. I think she's a little frustrated almost, but at the same time afterwards she says, that's that's great, Let's. I want to try that out. Yeah, for five seconds. For five seconds, oh, that was wonderful. So cleansing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Do you think, like when you first watched this episode, did you think that she would start to appreciate his silent wisdom no no okay i think so. she's just very frustrated because she loves to talk so much that she would i don't know want somebody who would also want to talk but at the same time she loves to hear the sound of her own voice so maybe it's the perfect match someone who talks all the time and someone who doesn't talk at all mm. Do you think she would appreciate it? I thought maybe she would stop pressuring him as often. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's a good point. And that she would... That maybe he would kind of extend that to her because you haven't really seen him interact with her. Mm-hmm. He's almost like a handbag for her, you know? Like, he's yeah. an accessory right. to her at this, at this point. And I think that was probably the most emotion and kind of back and forth she's ever seen from Jianyu. So I think that when I was watching it for the first time, I thought, okay, maybe this will help them understand each other a little bit more or help her understand him anyway, because I think he understood who she was. She talks so dang much that it's hard not to, right? But I thought that this would help her get him. Yeah. yeah. At least start have... on that path yeah, to understanding. Yeah, to start bonding. Yeah. Unable to sleep, Eleanor remembers another evening out where she shirks her duty as a designated driver for the last time. Feeling guilty, Eleanor goes out to clean the rest of the trash by herself. Chidi acknowledges her good deed and decides that he will help her. The next morning, Chidi has moved into Eleanor's home so as to better facilitate her lessons. The episode ends as someone slides a note under Eleanor's front door, which reads, You don't belong here. Dun, dun, dun! Gasp! Which I love because... Cue cliffhanger. But it's not. It's a game changer. Yeah. Okay? Somebody's on to her. Yeah. That's not cheaty. Because it's not like, Oh my gosh, like, someone just got shot, but we don't know who, Mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's, whoa, the world that we thought we were in... You know, which was just cheating and Eleanor in on this secret has mm-hmm. suddenly changed. And it's not so much of a cliffhanger, I think, as a game changer, which is nice because I'm not left feeling frustrated. I'm left feeling like, oh, wow, we're moving the story along. Yeah. Like, perfect. You know, yeah. we're not going to stay in this one place. Right. We're going to find out soon who this person is, like, 
who slipped that note on the, under the door and that's going to create a whole other story. Exactly. It changes so. the show completely. It, mm-hmm. it moves it from, okay, now we're going to be having a show about a lady who's trying to be better and so she can fit into the good place. So now I think we can talk about the flashbacks. Sure. So what did you think of the flashbacks? Because we got a three beat. We had one, two, three flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all come after a conversation with Chidi, specifically sort of at moments where she's talking about how she doesn't want to be selfish or he's telling her that she is selfish. Like, it always seems to come after one of those moments. And these flashbacks really hammer down how selfish she is. Okay. Do Each you think one. they're effective? Do you think... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think they're all on the similar page. I don't think there needed to be three. Okay. They all seem to nail down the same point, but I still like them. They were short enough to keep me entertained and not bored. Okay. I think we're kind of getting the same beat as last episode. Like, Eleanor is selfish. She is given opportunities to not be selfish, and Mm -hmm. she doesn't take them. Like... In the first one, you can see she's the one in control, right? And she has the um, she has the names written down on little pieces of paper, and she's saying, "Oh, I have integrity, and I'm a good person." Like, but she's just lying through her teeth, right? <laughs> she eats the names. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah, which is crazy, and I'm surprised that her coworkers have ever asked her to come out with them I after know. that because. I know. You start eating, like, a bunch of paper and telling me that this is what integrity looks like? (laughs) I'm not inviting you out to drinks anymore. Let's just say that. But, yeah, and the second one is just sort of like, okay, so did Eleanor just conveniently forget? Or did she do this on purpose, like, got out of work early, got hammered first so that she could just pretend like she forgot about this responsibility? Definitely. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, the second flashback, I think, could be dropped. Okay. The third one almost had the potential to have a good message. But nope, she bails on them again. Mm-hmm. I think that these are some of the flashbacks that work the least for me. Hmm. Because I really feel like we're just hammering that same point. Like, Eleanor is selfish, which we already understand. We already know that she's a selfish person. She keeps trying to say and to disprove that she is a selfish person. um, Because Chidi keeps insisting that she is, right? But all of the evidence we have of her so far is just stacked against her. She is selfish. And she's not, either not very aware of her selfishness, or she doesn't care enough. Right? It's it's almost like Chidi's saying she's selfish. She doesn't believe it. So the show is showing us that she is. Multiple times. It could be that in the past, like on during her life on Earth, she was selfish and didn't really notice or didn't care. And now we have this episode where someone is pointing it out to her. So now she is very aware of the fact that she is actually selfish. Mm-hmm. And here she starts to actually feel some guilt. Right. Like all of those co-workers of her were trying to make her feel guilty. Like, hey, you're always the one who picks the name and it's never you. Or we're going to do a rotating system and it's your turn now. Like Mm -hmm. they're always trying to give her some sort of responsibility. And when she shirks that responsibility, she seems to have no care. If you bail on us this time, we're not inviting you out again. She doesn't care. She's like, cool, fine. I'll see you at work. Whatever. Yeah. None of it matters to her. And now we're seeing that in the good place, Chidi's opinion of her seems to matter. Mm -hmm. But not solely because she wants to stay there. I think it sort of hurts. Like... Right. I I feel like she is really starting to feel guilt for maybe one of the first times in this episode. I still don't think that the flashbacks are perfect, but I do like them a little bit more now that I'm thinking about them. Yeah. Yeah. So when you first watched this episode, did you have any theories about who wrote the note? Yes. Yeah? Who did you think it might be? I thought it was Michael. Oh, interesting. And then I thought, no, 
I think he would straight up just bring her into her, his office. So then I thought it was Gigi. Oh. Trying to scare her into oh. telling somebody else or telling Michael okay. or coming clean. Like, hey, there's I'm not the only one that knows about your secret. Like, there's other people here, so maybe you should come clean. So you thought that Chidi could be that malicious? That's pretty that, mean. I don't think that's, that's malicious mean. at all. I think That's manipulative. I think that's a way for him to get out of choosing. That's manipulative. Maybe he's just getting so frustrated with her lack of ethics that he thought he would try a new tactic. Hmm. Interesting. And maybe it would be a way to get her to be more honest and open. So in the end, it would be a positive thing. Honesty through fear. Fear is a big part of a lot of religions. Yeah, I guess the fear that you will go to hell or whatever version of it is or in your you religion. Or you make somebody upset or you... You will cross God. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, fear is definitely a, a big fear part Fear is of... a good motivator. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say it's a very moral motivator. Um, interesting. I actually kind of thought it was Tahani. I don't... Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not really sure why. I assumed it would be her. Um, I just thought, okay, well, I don't think it's Chidi. Because Chidi was just in the house and like, what? Did he just run outside and push that <laughs> yeah. thing in? That's what I thought. Probably I was like, did he not. have time to run around the house and slip <laughs> it under the door? Maybe not. <laughs> We're going to go back and like see him doing like some Mission Impossible thing yeah. really quickly. Um I just assumed it was Tahani because she's so arrogant. Mm. And maybe she had picked up on something that Eleanor had said at some point and just thought, oh, well, she doesn't belong here because I'm so much better than her. Right. I thought it was either her or someone we hadn't seen yet. Because I did notice when Eleanor was talking to Chidi saying, well... Have fun cleaning suckers. I'm going to be soaring like a fork and bird. Mm -hmm. I did notice people hearing her, like behind her, that were actually looking at Eleanor and seemed to be, you know, responding to what she was saying. So I thought, oh, maybe it's going to be one of those people. An extra in the... turns into a regular. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. somebody we don't know yet who's going to become part of the main cast. Sure. Yeah, that's when... what I thought. Yeah. It was either Tahani or... An unknown at this point. That's that's what I assumed. Um, the last thing I want to say before we do get to the spoiler zone is that I think Chidi's choices of books are questionable. He has On the Way to Language by Heidegger and a few others that I noticed were also written by Heidegger. Heidegger doesn't really talk about ethics, um, but he's known for his work in phenomenology. It's the philosophical study of the structures of experience and consciousness. He's also known for his work in existentialism. So I don't think they're the greatest place to start. It's and not heavy. only that, but Heidegger is considered to be difficult to understand. And basically one of the worst ones to start with. I had to read some of his, some excerpts of his work, Being and Time, where he talks about, like, the concept of being, like, consciousness and all that kind of stuff. And it's very difficult to parse through his language because he starts creating, like, he's German and he started creating words for things that we don't have words for yet. Or huh. that we don't have words for in you know, the English language or the German language. Mm -hmm. So he started kind of creating his own words to try to convey a certain meaning. And he's very complicated. So I was like, really, Chidi, you're starting with Heidegger. Do you want Eleanor to hate this? Because she's going to hate it. She's going to be like, I'm so confused. I have no idea what you're talking about or what any of this is. So, Do you think maybe he's that <laughs> oblivious to the material or do you think maybe he's trying to manipulate and by dumping so much on her that she'll just give up? I think that he's kind of trying to start his discussion of ethics with Eleanor, starting with like the biggest concepts, right? Mm -hmm. Versus just diving straight into... What's good of and what's not. <laughs> morality, right? <laughs> right. Um, 
and going with some philosophers that are a little bit more easy to understand and that are more applicable to her situation, right? What did you think of his idea of having, like, quizzes and papers and assignments? Do you think that's, like, a good way to teach Eleanor ethics? No. No. Because I don't think Eleanor will learn through quizzes and tests and assignments. Okay. I think she's the type of person who needs to almost be walked through these these types of scenarios, maybe do some role-playing Okay. Uh, more more hands-on learning. She needs to see examples. She needs to watch them. She needs to emulate them. Okay. So you think that Eleanor would learn better through experience? Yes. Like by doing instead of by retaining knowledge. Right. So okay. the situation that Chidi thrust her into at the beginning of this episode, volunteering to clean up garbage, it's great. It's a great stepping stone. Mm -hmm. There needs to be more situations like that. Okay. He basically needs to be with her all the time and guide her through her life in the good place. Right. I think that there's a merit to understanding different views um, of moral philosophy and, like, studying different philosophers, but I think it needs to happen in the context of this particular world like of the good place right and of what is applicable to her like learning all about all kinds of different philosophy i don't think is going to be helpful i think he needs to narrow his focus Mm -hmm. and i think he needs to mix like schooling with experience right so kind of doing both shadowing her helping her make her decisions I think, would be the best way to approach this. I don't think Eleanor will benefit knowing the names of the philosophers or what the difference is between each of their teachings. I don't think that matters to her. All she needs to know is how to be good. And then Chidi can take that information of how she's being a better person and perhaps explain to her what you're doing is based on Kant's philosophy or what you're doing is Aristotle's view of life because of this and this and this. And that gives her the understanding of, hey, I just did all that. That makes sense to me because I've lived through it. The idea that she might be able to identify with a philosopher is kind of nice because like she says in this episode, Aristotle, that's my boy. Like yep. he was the best one, right? Uh-huh. So immediately she starts to identify with him and then she may want to learn a little bit more about how he thinks, right? And see if that applies to her. Mm. Because I think that's what a lot of people do with philosophers. Like they learn about them and then they start to feel like maybe a connection to that kind of thinking. They start to feel like, oh, no, that makes a lot of sense for me. Mm-hmm. And then they can try and model themselves like, a little bit. That's the way bit. That I think. Yeah. And then they can try and model themselves after that kind of interpretation of morality. Sure. And, uh, and that can help them, like, guide them. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say that regardless, like, either way, if it came kind of like after or you had it just all jumbled up together, I think it would be helpful to still have both. Yeah. Instead okay. of just experience. Okay. Yeah. One little thing I noticed about this episode and all subsequent episodes about Janet. I love it. Every time anybody asks for Janet, she always shows up in a different spot. So if you're staring straight ahead and you ask for Janet and you want her to pop up in front of you, she'll always pop up somewhere else that's not convenient at all. (laughs) It's always off to the side or behind you or in the opposite direction you're facing. It's always the worst possible place. So every time anybody's like, Janet, she'll always pop up somewhere and you can always see them looking around. And it's fantastic. (laughs) I love it. It gives them a little bit of surprise every time, right? Sure. Where are you going to pop up this time? And I think that's part of what Janet does on purpose. She leaves a little bit, I'm in control. I make you look around. I'll show up wherever I damn well please. Okay. Yeah. All right. (laughs) A little bit of a Janet power trip, maybe. I do not agree with you. 
No. Okay. I think that it may be another malfunction of the good place. That she should be showing up right in front of you, but maybe she's not. She never did, Because there's something... Though. No, I know. Oh, but, okay, okay. But maybe that's right. part of it. Like, maybe Michael kind of messed up a little bit because huh. I sort of have a sense that Michael, like, her programming maybe isn't completely controlled by him, but maybe her physical presence there is kind of. So I assume that there was something wrong with that. Like, she should be showing up in front of you, but she's not. She's showing up around you. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's close enough. It's close enough. But it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. All right. That brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes because this is the best way for others to find the show. We are loving the feedback that we've gotten so far, and we just hope that you guys will keep talking to us, keep telling us your thoughts and your opinions on this show. We love talking to you. So, if you have any thoughts you want to share, You can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt or find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can also visit our website and send us an email through that at multiverseradio.ca. And we'll see you next week for our review of episode three. Tahani Al-Jamil. Yes, it is our first episode named after a character. Hmm. All right, so if you've watched the entire show, you've seen everything, then please join us for the spoiler zone. If you're watching along with us, then please stop before the music. If you're leaving us now, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. The spoiler zone, where everything is spoilery all the time. We spoil movies, we spoil TV shows, we spoil food. (laughs) This suddenly became like a wrestling match. (laughs) So right off the bat, Michael says, if one single blade of grass is off, then things can go haywire. Yep. Gives you the idea that heaven is a construction that can fail which isn't really a good place at all if it has the possibility or have the potential to fail then to me that just seems like a regular place yep i wanted to ask you what do you think michael's plan is like what do you think his end game is when he's confiding into honey make her worried okay she's already starting to get a little concerned Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's definitely concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think he's also trying to poke a little bit at Jason. So I think he's just poking little holes here and there of Tahani's, you know, beautiful exterior. Interesting. Yeah, I kind of think that his desire here was to make Tahani feel lesser than compared to Jianyu cuz she doesn't manage to help him. Right. Like she can't make him feel any better but Jason does. Hmm. Or in her mind Jianyu does. This person who isn't really doesn't really seem to be putting a lot of effort in, who just seems to like naturally have this gift, which is just exactly how her sister is, right? Right. Um I feel like she's trying to like I feel like Michael is trying to make Tahani feel a little bit insecure, maybe a little bit jealous. Resentful, even. Yeah, and maybe to make her feel bad for not being able to connect with her, you know, apparent soulmate. Like, Mm -hmm. Michael has, you know, this one interaction with Jianyu, and... He's already connecting. Yeah, he's already connecting, and for some reason she can't. Like, I think he's really trying to poke, like, very subtly Mm -hmm. at her. Um... I think that we should have known that Michael is evil because of what he does to Teacup. <laughs> Kicking the dog into the sun is pretty much like a dead giveaway. Yeah, it super is. It's like a huge hint. So I wanted to ask you because uh, our listener, Alan, asked what we think is doing the scoring. 
So we know that there's a score for yep. people, and we know after watching the finale that your intent matters, and that all those points, you know, we can assume that part of those points were false, right? Like we know that Tani's point value and Chidi's point value and Eleanor's point value are all made up, right? Um. But the ones that we see in the first episode and, like, the ones that we do see, do you think, like, who do you think is doing that point, the scoring? Who do you think came up with the algorithm? Or who do you think, because I think everything that Michael showed them is just false. So you don't think there is a point system? I think there is, but I think that the examples he showed could be totally skewed. Okay. Okay. I I don't believe that there's a singular higher being in this universe, in this collection of good places or bad places. Okay. I think it's a board of directors or something, and they all confer together and come up with the perfect algorithm and the perfect system. But I still, I still don't think that anything that he showed us is exactly true. There may be... Like, I'm sure there would be a, a system, but I don't think he showed them anything legit. Hmm. To be honest, I never really thought about what was doing the scoring. Like, I just went along with it, you know, oh, okay, you guys get scores. And then as soon as it's revealed that none of them are actually, none of them actually belong in the good place. Mm-hmm. I still didn't think about, well, who's doing the scoring? Like, w- w- do does the scoring system is it even real anymore like Mm -hmm. what we saw in the first episode is that still the model that we're operating under and all of these people just have negative points like maybe it's completely binary maybe there are no points maybe it's just this person was good this was bad based on one person could have thought hey let's look at their life overall consensus yeah they were pretty good so they go to heaven yeah maybe there's no actual mathematical equation to it it's Mm -hmm. possible if there is still a mathematical equation, if there are still points awarded to every action or taken from every action, like mm-hmm. bad ones, right? That's something that I would like to see explored in season two, I think. More about the point system? Yeah, a little bit more about how do people get there and who's making the decisions. Who's in control. Yeah, who's in control. Who's at the top. And is it just, like, some crazy supercomputer type thing? Is it an actual person? Is it some sort of weird collection of the universe's energy? Like, what is it, right? So that would be something I'd like to see explored in season two. Hmm. And uh, listeners, if you guys have any, you know, thoughts or... Um, predictions about what this might be, let us know. I'd love to hear what you guys think. So a couple more thoughts again from um, Alan. Alan said that he thinks Michael is uh, omniscient, Mm -hmm. so all-knowing, while Janet is omnipotent, so she has unlimited power and she's able to do anything. Right. Um. And that she's omnipresent, so that she can be everywhere at the same time. I don't think I agree with that. I agree with most of it. I agree with most of it. I think it's, like, mostly true, or partially true, but Janet has unlimited power, but she also has restrictions. Like, she can't reveal anything about the bad place. And she's still vulnerable to humans... And to human will because she can be shut off. Like yep. she has an off button. She can't stop people from turning no, it off. No, she can try by trying to convince them, you know, and um, and sh- by showing emotion, right? But she also reminds them, I'm not real. You're not actually hurting me. This doesn't actually hurt, right? Yeah. So that is a sort of power in the sense that she won't die, Right. But she's still subject to human will. She's still... Like, she doesn't have any agency of her own. Mm -hmm. And in the case that there are restrictions, then she's not omnipotent. Right. Now... And what do you think about her being omnipresent? Being everywhere at the same time? Totally agree. Because if two people need 
Janet's help at the same time, then I'm sure she's able to be at both places at once. I don't think she is. Really? Okay. No. I Like had... you got to wait for your Janet in queue? Whoever calls Janet first, I think. Really? Okay. Yeah. I think she would operate on sort of a queue. Um, Why? Because there's only one Janet. Okay. So I think that she can be anywhere and appear anywhere, but I don't think she's everywhere at the same time. Okay. You know, at least that's the impression that I got. Like she can just sort of pop up from wherever she is. Like if she's walking around beside Michael, just walking through the city center and someone says, Janet, then she can just pop out from where she's walking with Michael and pop over to them. But I don't think that she could be with Michael at the same time that she is with Eleanor, that she is with Chidi, and then is with Tahani, and is with Jason. Like, I think she's only in one place at one time. That would be frustrating, wouldn't it? To only have one for your entire community? I mean, I guess it's not huge. It's not a huge community. I mean, of course it would be nice to have more than one Janet, but I don't think people would be asking for janet so often that it would become a huge issue so if you asked for janet and she didn't appear it was just because she was busy with somebody else yeah i guess so or maybe there's like some weird sort of notification system or something like that pops up and it says yeah janet will be with you in five minutes or something like that you know or will be with you shortly that's possible right i think that's something that they could definitely address the next season very easily Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely just by having two people ask for her at the same time yeah and just her saying just a minute yeah or like i'll be with you in a moment yeah something like that (laughs) with that like customer service attitude of like yeah i'll be with you in a second sir (laughs) you know or she'll split in two and talk to both of them at the same time and Mm -hmm. we'll have her answer and uh, on the same topic we're again uh talking about janet Alan also thinks that Janet is an example of an Eastern religious archetype of the Shoshin. So this is a concept from Zen Buddhism that means beginner's mind. So it refers to having an attitude of openness and eagerness and a lack of preconceptions when studying a subject, even when you're studying at an advanced level. Like just seeing the world and seeing a subject as a beginner. Completely open and ready to absorb anything. Yeah, and and eager, right? Sure. Um, Janet's definitely eager. What do you think? Do you think that's a pretty accurate description of what Janet is? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, I don't know if I'd explain that's what she's based on. Okay. I'd say that there's a good similarity. Yeah. I somehow doubt the creators were thinking what archetype can we base Janet on? They were probably more like, let's have an all-knowing person or all-knowing being be able to help everybody. Mm-hmm. Who's then, sort of innocent and childlike very in, in childlike, a sense. Very yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I doubt that they were really thinking that deeply into it, but I think it's cool that it still relates. Yeah. Um, and... I like this idea of this attitude of openness and eagerness because that's kind of who Janet is, right? She's not there to judge you. She doesn't care about what you're going to ask her for. Um, And she's always eager to help people. Like, she's a very kind person as much as she is a person, right? Right. Um, And by the end of the show, Jason does consider her a person. Like, he... It's his wife at that point, right? He cares about her and thinks of her as a human being. Yeah. And is constantly being confronted with the knowledge that she's not a human being. <laughs> he doesn't And not seem accepting to, it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I really... I like that he pointed that out. Um, because it just sort of made me think about Janet's attitude a little bit more. Yeah. So. I love Janet's attitude. Oh, I love Janet. I cannot wait until we get into, like, bad Janet and the rebooted Janet Mm -hmm. when everything happens with Jason. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. Got so much to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So, do you have anything else to say or should we end there? I think we should end there. Okay, let's end there. All right. 
Thank you so much for sticking with us through the spoiler zone. We will see you next week.